It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest, episode 256, at block height 670,612 on Sunday, February 14th. So what is up, Janine, and how is it hanging, Chris? Hey. Roses are red, violets are blue. Happy Valentine's Day from CIA to you. Okay, That's government. Good, say. Stop it. Just stop it, governments. Okay. You're not going to come off as lovable like a Valentine's creepy. Just just stop. Just make it stop. The fact that we're doing this uh, podcast on Valentine's Day makes us all losers, right? <laughs> eh, who cares? Maybe we should talk about love and. Eh. No. Nah. I think I'm just going to get drunk and buy a hooker later. Or my style. Wow. Wow. What with Bitcoin? Would you do it over Lightning? See, that's how you oh, get targeted yeah. by Love Int. I don't even know what that is. What? You don't know what Love Int is? Nope. Go so, on. So, it's, it's kind of a joke, um, but uh, part of the Snowden disclosures uh, was the revelation that, surprise, surprise, um, these agencies are run by human beings, and uh, human beings tend to abuse tools like this to spy on their romantic interests, or perhaps former romantic interests. So spelled love, I-N-T, it's supposed to be a joke on, like, human, which is human intelligence, so it's love intelligence. And um, according to known documents, there was, like, this is, like, actually a pretty rampant problem it's actually one of the uh most common um violate privacy violations that the nsa had at the time according to a audit that the nsa conducted um and also what was disturbing is that a lot of the times where people were caught doing this it was because they self-reported or because they told someone or the person they were targeting told someone like another government employee who then reported it, um, most of it was not getting caught by the NSA itself, which tells you a lot about how good they are about uh, keeping track of their own people. The pun clicked about a sentence or two in, and it just made all the tweets today even creepier. Mm -hmm. NSA loves us too, by the way. I don't love it, though, and I never This will. is why... This is why you should never date a spy. Unless they're hot Russian, Asian, or Israeli and want you to portray your country. In which case, go for it, dude. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I guess let's get the mosey on the road with a little, little comment before we get into a full story. But um, did did you guys see... Andrew Yang talking about if he were to win the New York City mayoral race, um, he would start doing everything he could to make New York City as Bitcoin a friendly place as possible. K kind of uh, echoing the sentiments of the Miami mayor looking into stuff right now. I love this so much. I mean, good luck with that. That would basically be a complete uh, 180 flip from what New York is right now, which is crypto Azkaban. Well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, like, let's, let's go. Let's do this. I want to see every city in the country doing this because one of my biggest worries about this space for the next 10 years or so is larger federal governments starting to clamp down on mining. And if we can get all the city governments and shit to start exposing themselves to Bitcoin, benefit from Bitcoin, that's the incentive alignment where you have people who can actually fight the larger governments over stuff like that. Like, no, 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 we're not going to go along with what you want to do because that 
loses no, no, no. us money. But like, you know, what I mean, if, if this type of like city, county, like smaller governments looking at Bitcoin starts dominoing, that is so much safer of an environment for mining. Just looking at the incentives of different levels of government. I mean, yeah, I guess in the grand scheme of things, it's better to have people in the government who are at least not hostile to Bitcoin. So uh, I don't really see the downside of this. It's just that I'm really skeptical that um, <laughs> that New York is going to be one of the early birds in that respect. Well, probably, but it's, it's just the fact that like it, it's it's catching on as a meme. Like Andrew Yang is bringing this up in relation to his campaign for the mayor. Like that's that's yeah. a very good sign. And that's assuming that he even wins, which is uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't really know how to judge that. Um, I know people do not like De Blasio right now, but yeah, I, I wouldn't even know where to start gauging sentiment about Yang. Let's make city states happen. It's a better way than selling out the desert to major megacorps. If you say so. Anyway, though, why don't you uh, tell us what's going on in Nigeria as far as the response to the central bank um, not liking remittances disappear? Well, as we talked about in the last episode, the Nigerian central bank is ordering the closure of cryptocurrency exchange activity in the country and also trying to identify customers who have used them. I don't know if they consider them to be of equal uh, weight in terms of supposed violations, but um, they definitely want to figure out how many Nigerians are you know, using cryptocurrencies, I expect. And on February 11th, the Nigerian Senate Twitter account was sharing that morning's Senate plenary, and one of the motions for discussion was the central bank's decision to stop financial institutions from transacting in cryptocurrencies and matters arising therefrom. And at one point, uh, one of the senators, Sani Musa, stated, cryptocurrency has become a worldwide transaction uh, I assume he meant platform or medium, of which you cannot even identify who owns what. The ch technology is so strong that I don't see the kind of regulation that we can do. Bitcoin has made our currency almost useless or valueless. If we have an economy that is very weak and we cannot regulate cryptocurrency in Nigeria, then I don't know how our economy would be in the next seven years. Um, I mean, that's a pretty big statement, but I would like to point out, um, no senator, Bitcoin has not made your cryptocurrency or has not made your currency useless it just exposed that your currency is useless because bitcoin just by existing has given your citizens an escape from your terrible system of money management uh but that does not mean it did anything to harm uh <laughs> how terrible your currency already was um it just is a mirror <laughs> that got held up to it and you don't look so great sorry not sorry um, but then Alyssa Hertig from Coindesk also published an article the day before that interviewed Nigerian Bitcoiners, or I mean, I don't know if they're all specifically Bitcoiners, but um, Nigerian cryptocurrency users. And uh, one anonymous person said, there's no stopping crypto. It's the future and we won't let some old fools take our future from us. We're Nigerians using the crypto uh, is the way out of poverty for the youth. Um, and then a Nigerian Bitcoin core contributor, Tim Akinbo, said Bitcoin is peer to peer, meaning that it cannot be transacted without intermediate. It can be transacted without intermediaries. Your bank may be able to shut down your account, but no one can shut down your Bitcoin wallet. This development wall concerning will not be the end of Bitcoin in Nigeria. And then Chimezi Cha, uh, who Chris uh, is familiar with, described the directive as ill-advised, archaic, retrogressive, insensitive, and smacks of primitive superstition. Nice. Good job, Chimezi. I mean, I just find it really interesting the kinds of worries they have, but the fact that they were also like, hold on a second, like, you have to justify this. <laughs> yep. I mean, like Niger Nigeria really could be a test bed as far as where we see Bitcoin just break a government and they just it's like 
either come along for the ride or have fun staying poor. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess uh, the big concern is that a lot of the uh, regular people are going to possibly get rich. And I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, a, lo a lot of the time what happens in these poor countries that also, you know, we in the last episode where we talked about the central bank directive, um, I also uh, highlighted the uh, older story that I had mentioned in a talk I did last year about the uh, Nigerian Femis coalition getting their bank accounts shut down while they were protesting police brutality. So there's other issues involved here. And a lot of the time, if people get the resources, whether in amount or just being able to secure their own assets or property, they'll just move out of the country. So the thing that they're probably really scared of is not so much whether Bitcoin will somehow affect the economy. It's more about how Bitcoin might uh, enable their own people to make a decision about whether they want to s continue living in Nigeria. Yep. And it's like, I mean, that's, that's what we see. That's but it, what we it's see like, with Venezuela. Yeah. And it's like that, that dynamic here is exactly why given that they clearly recognize the threat and the problem here, if they start seeing that happen on mass, then what choice do they have to just bend over and let Bitcoin do its thing and try to get as much benefit out of it as possible? Yeah. I mean, I guess, uh, I mean, if they were smart, they would do, they would do what some of these, uh, mayors are doing, like regardless of whether I think it really matters in the long term, if they, have any hope of like retaining people and not making the industry hostile to them, they would be receptive to it. I mean, there there's a lot of potential from just a nationalist perspective for them to be like, well, maybe this will help us be less dependent on, you know, foreign countries who basically want to use our resources and exploit our people for various ends and this will help with our independence like they could take it that way instead mm -hmm. and at least in my opinion if there's you know anywhere in the world that could happen um someplace in africa that's it chris has nothing to say about breaking governments come on it's it's fun we, we get to talk about how governments can well, break because because we bought magic internet money the founder of Paxful was actually on the Kaiser Report or, or the Orange Pill. I get them confused now um, this week. So I would highly recommend you check that out. I thought that guy had a lot of really interesting things to say um, because, you know, their business uh, mainly focuses on Africa, which is not an obvious, you know, business case. But um, these people uh, that are, uh, sorry, these countries uh, in, in this these parts of the world, these developing countries are the ones that are in most need of bitcoin and its features and it's kind of ironic that uh, the west has ended up championing it and we're seeing all these uh, posturings from various states i love the way that bitcoin does that i love that it pitches these states uh, between each other uh, wyoming of course was like the first one to really go full bitcoin um with its laws and so on i i love the incentive mechanisms it's just pure anarchy it just really exploits the gap between the borders where the earth still has that power over us as a political species and i think it's going to do the same with a lot of these developing countries and i really look forward to seeing the first developing country that actually tries to capitalize on bitcoin the way the united states have i mean the individual states not the whole country mm -hmm. Like, imagine if Nigeria, like what, what they could do for Africa as a whole, just by improving their economy, by just going with this instead of trying to fight it. Well, look, I've said this on, on Twitter, you know, if you follow me, you might see it. I mean, I had this sort of idea that thought the other day that as a deflationary asset backed by thermodynamics, Bitcoin is really a progress bar on the capturing of the, the GDP of the planet. It's essentially synchronizing with the global economy. It's capturing all the value and it's not going to be uh, really useful as a currency until the super rich can buy large purchases with it like yachts without slipping the market. At the moment, that's not really possible. I mean, rich, rich people can buy large tranches of uh, Bitcoin through over OTC. Um, but the thing is that, that they have to do it quite slowly. It's still not, we're still not quite there yet. Um, it, the, the market needs to grow before, before it stabilizes. I mean, that's the perfect way to put it, though. It's like that's the kind of opportunity in front of Nigeria. Like if they stopped fighting this, if they 
how started accumulating in, in government treasuries Bitcoin, letting people do that, then their population is going to be that capturing uh, of GDP value globally and be able to reinvest it in their own country to develop their own resources, how to have an African nation making those investments in other African nations instead of companies from halfway around the world. Yeah, well, essentially, when you when you own Bitcoin, you're sharing in the surplus value that's created in the in the global economy because uh, because it's deflationary, its value will go up as the the economy grows, and so you will then get a share of that. If you don't have any Bitcoin, you don't get to enjoy that. Yep. What this is really exposing is just that these politicians are corrupt, and they don't want that corruption to end. <laughs> well, too bad they don't have a choice. Alrighty, are we ready for some good old fashioned? Autism? I've never been officially mm. diagnosed, actually. You mean as opposed to uh, modernist autism? Or futuristic autism? How about cryptographic autism? Well, it is, it is episode 250, 256 today, so magic number. Zing. So uh, Blockstream has actually dropped um, two very interesting... Um, fancy autistic things um in the last week the the first of which is a new um algorithm being implemented for libsec p 256k1 that winds up with a uh, 25 percent improvement in signing speed and a 15 percent improvement in um signature validation pretty much um just playing funny math games um so let, let's let's try and not look stupid on my part here. Um, <laughs> uh, pretty much a, a huge part of the math behind the crypto in, in Bitcoin is the the modular inverse relationship between two numbers. So effectively, like the exponential um, relationship between two points in a graph and how these are currently implemented in um, LibSec P256K1 is with an exponentiation ladder. So pretty much just a lot of sequential exponential operations, but that's kind of slow and inefficient. And there is an alternative um, kind of Euclidean geometric algorithm for doing those types of math problems, but you trade off a speed improvement for effectively not knowing how many operations it's going to take with that algorithm to finish a signature or verify a signature. So depending on the actual variables involved, um, one signature could be verified way faster than another just because of how that algorithm is structured. And that's a very bad thing because if specifically structured signatures could have a higher validation cost um, that turns into a wonky unpredictable way to kind of dos validating nodes and so <clears throat> there is a, a variant of this kind of algorithm that you can actually guarantee will always take the same time in each operation effectively just by doing it so many times, no matter how many times are actually necessary, that whatever that that length of uh, or amount of operations is, is enough to verify any um, kind of signature that that could encounter. And the problem there was pretty much finding out what that that bounds were how many times that you would do this operation so that it would always validate properly for everything. And Blockstream put together um, the um, a formal proof using the uh, the Coke language. It's kind of a, a functional programming language that allows mathematical proofs of correctness. And this is um, a huge tool in what they're using to develop simplicity, the scripting language they're working on but actually we're able to formally prove that implementing this algorithm with 590 iterations on the operation would cover anything that it could possibly have thrown at it and do so in constant time with this speed up versus the current implementation. 
So once again, um, autists at Blockstream have just made a pretty significant improvement in validation efficiency that when it hits the actual core node implementation, um, it's going to make a real big difference for everybody. How do you know that they're autists? Because anybody working at Blockstream is autistic, or they wouldn't be allowed to work at Blockstream. That, that actually might be illegal. I mean, there are employment laws. But I didn't say that. That's getting good. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it blows my mind with stuff like this, that like, just mathematical academic stuff being pecked away and then away and then all of a sudden there's code and hey here's a serious improvement in validation costs for actual users of bitcoin i mean like 15 percent speed up time for verifying all ecdsa signatures that's huge all right all right you, you ready you ready for the next autistic thing my body's ready i, think you, I don't you know actually, if i'm ready I think you, you might actually really like this one, Chris. Um, so they have also dropped um, in partnership, um, although I'm not sure to what degree, um, with Ship Crypto, a anti-exfiltration protocol um, to safeguard hardware wallets against side channel nonce attacks. And so, you know, I'm sure everybody listening should know, I'm sure everyone here does, that the nonce for a transaction is effectively just hashing the thing you're signing and the key you're using to sign it so that you can guarantee no funny business is going on. But you can't really practically verify as a user that your device is doing that properly. And so effectively, um, they put together a protocol where the host computer, the wallets plugged in, would actually generate a uniform random piece of data and then send the hash of that data to the hardware wallet. The host computer would then receive the nonce that the hardware wallet has um, suggested. And then from that point, it will actually pass the pre-image of the the random thing it generated and passed off the hash of to the hardware wallet again and be able to verify that the hash that the device is actually signing, the, the host computer can verify that it took this secure randomness um, from me and this is actually part of the hash and prove that you aren't doing funny business in terms of trying to bias nonces to slowly leak keys over time. And so setting things up this way, um, pretty much any hardware device that implemented this um, and properly would display a warning screen if this kept failing repeatedly, um, the user could stop, know that device is compromised. And that warning would not only um, protect the hardware wallet from doing something malicious, but that safety check because it would take many signatures if the host computer was malicious and trying to get the hardware device to bias the nonce or play games and leak information, that warning would actually protect against that too. So th there's actually like a, a thought out protocol that can deal with a lot of the side channel nonce attacks in, in a pretty elegant way, I think. So this is definitely, finally, Developers have been screaming about side channel nonce attacks for literally years, and there's finally a solution that's not just trust the thing you're using. Well, that's great. Woohoo! Well, so I have to say, uh, since this involves nonces, um, since it's Valentine's Day, I have to quote uh, Francis Poulier when he said uh, that true love is a high difficulty nonce. I like that. No, I like that a lot. It's amusing. It's true. You have to be quite technical to get it, though. That's just a filter in and of itself that you want to use, right? Right, exactly. And our audience is super smart, so... True love is the person who understands that true love is a high-difficulty nonce. <laughs> the, the phrase itself is a high-difficulty nonce. <laughs> 
there's too much recursion. There is clearly cryptography occurring here. Alrighty, though. Alrighty, lovebirds. So, Janine, you were telling me the other day about a very hilarious Chainalysis report that you were reading. Yeah, so um, this month Chainalysis published their crypto crime report for 2021, which basically analyzes activities since 2015, but especially the last year. Um, and the subtitle is, quote, everything you need to know about ransomware, darknet markets, and more. But to be honest, after reading all 113 pages of it this weekend, I found it to be hilariously wrong about at least one of those things in several aspects. First of all, they have this term darknet market in a lot of their charts as a category of crime in addition to child sexual abuse material or CSAM, ransomware, drugs, scams, domestic extremism is also in there. They actually don't have foreign extremism. They have just domestic extremism, which is weird. But um, anyway, hmm. uh, it makes no sense to me that they have this category darknet market because that does that mean they're assuming that all transactions that pass through a so-called darknet market are illicit? Because that is not true for anyone who has ever actually looked at darknet markets in reality. Um, I don't really clarify anywhere that I can see what they classify as a darknet market. Or I mean, they have a chart that has a list of specific darknet markets that they looked at for a particular thing about like the inflows and outflows but it's not clear especially for like the beginning charts what what they included in that they don't publish as far as i could tell i mean i look through the entire thing and i don't recall seeing like a specific definition or how they how they justified making this a category in itself it just seems really weird um because obviously it's not inherently illegal to just have a forum or a merchant platform on a Tor hidden service, which is, I assume, what they mean. Using Tor, running Tor is not illegal in most countries, so the fact that it's really ill-defined in this report, despite being like a central focus, makes it really suspicious. Of course, if you consider that these reports are mostly meant for law enforcement and compliance people in order to justify their own existence, the ambiguity is not surprising because this is not serious scholarship, it's just PR. Um, but the reason this should be considered chart fraud especially is that if you remove darknet markets as a category in a lot of the charts, the percentage of cryptocurrency and or network activity um, compared to the total drops by almost half and the percentage is already quite low at like 2% or less of, you know, the entire um, transaction activity for these networks, including Bitcoin. So this report is literally hyper focusing on something that is largely a non issue and potentially over reporting it by classifying all dark net market activity as illicit when that's not true at all. Like there's entirely normal products uh that are sold on <laughs> through hidden services um that is not an issue yes when you have privacy and anonymity people also buy things that the government does not want them to buy that's true but they also buy a lot of normal stuff because they just want to have some privacy um then let me scroll there is a paragraph on page 21 which says Nearly all of the illicit activity we cover in this report consists of cybercrime, what we'll refer to as cryptocurrency native, meaning crime that is practically dependent on cryptocurrency or inherently inter interwined with it. Take darknet markets, for example. Darknet markets as we know them run entirely on cryptocurrency, with millions of dollars worth flowing through their centralized networks of wallets every day. Since these services actively solicit new customers online, it's not all that difficult for us to identify their cryptocurrency addresses and track their transaction activity. Um, yeah, so they're, they're trying to say that Bitcoin invented darknet markets, aka arranging to buy things anonymously on the internet. Um, yeah, if you think that, you really don't have any clue how the internet works. <laughs> uh, it's not true that darknet markets are entirely based on cryptocurrency. There are some that are, but there are still plenty of cash-based options. They use prepaid cards. 
No, and not even the stolen kind, just regular prepaid cards. Uh, they use Farmville credits, whatever thing you can find that could be used as an exchange of for an exchange of value. Um, they there's probably an option to use that somewhere. Um, so yeah. Furthermore, on a I think it's page sixty, they state uh, they focus on a specific Telegram based uh, forum. Uh, for darknet market and also again using darknet market which is not correct if it's on telegram but they say televend is a telegram based platform with over 150,000 users where darknet market vendors can sell drugs through automated chatbots whose communications with buyers are highly encrypted um yeah telegram <laughs> highly encrypted all wrong telegram is also not a, a hidden service therefore I don't Oh, what exactly? I mean, it just like it all depends on what you consider to be the darknet market. If you just consider the darknet to be things that you can't search for on Google, I guess then Telegram is technically a darknet because it it's not searchable by Google. But um, like again, this is part of the problem with this report not clarifying its terminology that you get these weird uh, crossovers that don't make any sense because they didn't define their terms. Um, yeah, Telegram also not highly encrypted, especially if you're in a group chat. There's no encryption for the group chat, um, so good luck with that. And I'm not 100% sure if I recall it was chain analysis, but I remember there at least being another blockchain surveillance company who published a report in the last couple of years that claimed that Telegram is a peer-to-peer -peer encrypted messaging service. That is not true. Telegram is centralized and unencrypted for group chats, as I just said. So I can't believe I have to explain this. But once again, this is not serious scholarship at all. Like if these people think that Telegram is like epitome of darknet market communication services, they are so... <laughs> they are so screwed. <laughs> yep. I mean, hell, wait till they find out that buy mail drug services and markets literally predate the internet. People used to do that back in the 70s over payphones. Yeah. So yeah, this, I mean, this report is entertaining as a person who, like, I don't know, it's just, you just have to spend, like, a few minutes, like, reading and know that half of this stuff is bullshit so the only purpose as i said is for it to uh fan the faces of people who think that what they're doing is valuable when actually it's just financial surveillance with very little benefit because as they admit themselves like even if we were to take their statistics at face value the amount of crime we're talking about is like it's like minuscule in the grand scheme of things. Yep. I would bet that just the part of the city that I'm in does more in drug volume in a month or two than some of the darknet markets out there do in a year. I would make that bet. Yeah, and all I mean, day. um, I don't know. Do they do they include face hidden service uh, as part of the darknet here? Because a lot of people like you know, if if it it all depends on your definitions. If you say that any hidden service that allows you to communicate with other people and potentially arrange to buy things is a darknet market, then the darknet market is like that space is huge and it includes Facebook. So good luck with that. Yep. Every time you go through one of these reports, it just smells more and more like desperate PR to make themselves look like a necessary service. One of, one of the most interesting parts of the report was where they included um, screenshots of like offers from vendors uh, related to um, difficulties with shipping during COVID-19. Um, and they were like noting like, oh yeah, delivery deliveries were only 21% successful due to shipping disruptions because of the pandemic. That sounds about right. That was basically the only useful thing that I learned in this report. <laughs> I mean, it makes perfect sense. I remember earlier last year, like just things from like Amazon were like, why the fuck isn't that here yet? It's been two weeks. 
like I know this is a thing in a local warehouse. But yeah. Fuck chain analysis. So are we ready to get into a lot of unanswered questions? I am if you are. I am. So last week on the digest, we covered the disclosure of um <clears throat> a multi-sig bug for the cold card by Shift Crypto where the cold card was not doing an automated check when you create a multi-sig wallet <clears throat> that its xpub is one of the xpubs registered in that device um which is a legitimate issue setting up a wallet um that is not entirely just cold cards and entirely done without a coordinating computer in the middle um but then went on to claim there was no way to verify after the fact that this is correct. And I broke down how even though it's definitely not a friendly UI and it's a pain in the ass, you could just export a wallet file of the single key on the cold card. You could load that into a software wallet. <clears throat> you could check the child XPUB in that software wallet against your cold card. And then just to get that extra last step of verification, take a single address on the software wallet and then verify that on the cold card itself with the address explorer. Now, obviously that's a giant pain in the ass and it's not friendly or fun, but doing that, you can actually verify that multi-sig wallets currently set up for you were set up correctly and that that device's XPUB is involved. And they also, um, as usual, um, complained about not getting a bug bounty from CoinKite, despite it being clarified a few times ago that he's not going to pay out bug bounties to competitors' employees. And um, yeah, then you kind of got involved in that thread um, on Twitter with Jonas, and it came out that a, <clears throat> apparently Jonas Schnelly stepped down as the CEO of Shift Crypto with right. no public announcement or comment that I found even looking after the fact or saw at the time. Okay, so so let's go into it. So the news is the Bitcoin core developer Jonas Schnelli has departed from his role as president of the board of Shift Crypto RK, uh, formerly known as Shift Crypto Security RK and, and also formerly known as Shift Devices RK. They're based in Switzerland. They have in the past branded themselves as a security company. And so this came as a rather as a shock. So let's go back. So it was on the 11th of February, three days from the time of broadcast cast ago and uh, Jonas uh, quote tweets Benma otherwise known as Marco Ben Coon <clears throat> Uh, from shift crypto he's the lead developer there very competent very capable um i should also point out just before i go on i i was employed at shift crypto when it was shift devices and shift crypto security um for about a year in 2018-19 um and i was given the job title of head of product there so i i was there i was very familiar of course i know the team quite well so he quote tweets marco's tweets which reveals and and uh, promotes the the just this response disclosure that shinobi just mentioned um with the comments from from jonas uh, he comments don't use the cold card hardware wallet in a multi-sig setup and this of course prompted a bit of a flame war um we had rodolfo from cold card first to come in that bug is fixed he says should people not use bitbox because you forgot to use the secure element on the bitbox one um this of course <laughs> is alluding to the salim incidents no come on no schadenfreude please uh, this is serious news Sorry. broadcasting no, 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 I'm serious. All right, so let's try to cover this subjectively as we can because we, we do have our biases. Um, I used to work there. I mean, yeah, you, you like the cold card. I also like the cold card, but let's let's try to review it um, as objectively as we can. So this alludes to the, the Salim incident, which I believe was sometime around November, December 2018, um, where Salim revealed that despite the claims of Shift Crypto Security that it had a secure element, the secure element apparently did not appear to be enabled or did not have the... Uh, security features enabled thus rendering the, the the marketing claim a little bit of an issue for them um so the problem here is that when Salim did that disclosure he of course had the the you know the courtesy to tell everyone that these bugs had been fixed whereas Jonas doesn't do that here 
So then moving on down the thread, I'll take you through it. I'll skip over the um, the memes. You, we'll, we'll put the link down in the description below and you can enjoy those uh, separately. He then goes on to say, well, look, wouldn't use the BitBox one as well. I mean, his own device that, that he made. He wouldn't. He's saying he wouldn't even use it. He says, well, maybe I would use the cold card too. I think he might mean the Mark III. Um, but I highly doubt it with those amateurish executives. And this is, of course, when I step in and I say, amateurish executives, you said it. And what I'm alluding to there is my experiences working with the team. And this is when we get this revelation. Jonas says, most startups start amateurish. After a few years, you need to learn from it. Since I left Shift Crypto Bitbox, the amateurism seems gone. They are now doing really good. Uh, to me, it looks like CoinKite is still struggling with communication and transparency. So stop right there. So there's a few things we need to unpack here. First of all, yeah. nobody that I've spoken to since was aware that he left. Uh, I wasn't aware. I didn't see any announcements. I searched through his timeline. I searched through Cri Shift Crypto HQ on Twitter. I didn't see anything. I looked through their blog. He says that that he did a broadcast. He did some kind of podcast and uh, that it's up to us to go find that. Um, I haven't been able to find it so far. I've listened to two or three now that he's done. Um, I have more time this week to go through that. Um, so it's, it's a little weird. This is, this is an unusual way to announce you're stepping down as the chairman of a board, as we would say, in Anglo-Saxon legal culture or, or president, as they call it, in, uh, in Switzerland. But OK, all right. So Mr. Hoddle steps in. Why did you leave Shift Crypto Bitbox? Jonas. Plain and simple. Open source development is in disharmony with business-driven development. I'm a bad businessman. Business trade-offs are against my nature, as well as altcoin support. Oof. I wanted to stay away. Uh, sorry. I wanted to stay away. I keep meaning stay away. I wanted to stay away from the pressure to make money. I only care about Bitcoin. Okay, look. Props. I mean, I respect that. I think he's taken a little bit too much on himself here, to be honest. I don't think he was the only, you know, amateurish person there, um, because he's almost—it's almost as if he's implying that the 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 amateurishness has gone since he left. Therefore, it was because of him. I don't—I don't think that's fair uh, on Jonas at all. I mean, you're you're part of a team, um, but yeah, okay. So he wants to focus on Bitcoin. Uh, he got a lot of support from that. He was uh, the the tweet has been liked seventy four times so far, and he was also quote tweeted, and people were were congratulating him. I did pull him up on the transparency. I think it's great that Shift Crypto and their former founders are demanding transparency, not just from Cold Card, but anyone. I think it's really important in this industry. But I think leadership starts with you, right? Like if you're going to come out with a statement like we need more transparency, um, I think it's important that you go first. So I think that's Okay, Shift Crypto is not a public company. It's a private company. You could argue that they don't need to make an announcement when their chairman steps down. But you need to understand that Jonas Schnelli was pivotal to Shift, absolutely pivotal, because he is a Bitcoin core developer. He brings brand equity to the table. He was used in marketing literature. He was touted in front of investors. And I think Shift will probably find it quite challenging going forward in order, in order to raise money uh, without Jonas being there. So I do think that it warrants a response. And what's quite shocking here is that it would appear that Shift had time to do a, a security uh, disclosure on a competitor product, but didn't have the time to announce this this major shift in its board of directors. Um, and there are still yet more answers because actually Shift Crypto security, are gay, as I mentioned, actually uh, went into liquidation around March last year. Um, so they set up a new bankruptcy. entity. <clears throat> yeah, right. it's bankruptcy. Yeah. Yes. And, and there, there was a list of uh, creditors and they've all put in uh, their, their claims. I understand that the staff at Shift were informed not to talk about it. Um, uh, and I think, you know, certain NDAs were in place and so on. looks like they plan to enforce those. So I don't want to get anybody into trouble. Um, but yeah, it, it looks like that that has gone bankrupt, which then leads to questions. Well, what is this new entity? This is, they are now Shift Crypto are gay. Now, when they were pushed on this back in June, they actually stalled on announcing that as well, talking about transparency. So that happened around February, March time, uh, 2020. And then it wasn't until June real, real that quick, they Chris, put on the... It's just clicking into my head um you might want to explain that last um corporate entity meaning in switzerland because of how that sounds when pronounced yeah so it just all it stands for is ag and that's just a corporate designation 
German, and the way the reason he's pronouncing it that way is because that's how it's pronounced in German. Those two alphabet characters. Yeah, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the German on air now. But yeah, when you when you speak to a German speaking person, they they pronounce it "arge" and so on like that. Also, um, one, one thing, just a correction, because at the beginning, um, just want to make clear, Jonas Schnelli is and or was according to this um the president he was not, not the ceo the ceo douglas backham yes that's right. yeah did i say president or no that that Sorry, was no, uh, me i think oh, okay fair, fair, fair. yeah so so it, but it's easy to get confused by this story and so why is that relevant well one of the 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 sort of uh, features of this disclosure was that it had an air republic relations about it. It didn't just look like, you know, a bunch of independent security researchers uh, going off and, and you know, find, finding a vulnerability and disclosing it. Clearly, because of the, the relationship between these two companies and their history, which sadly we don't have time to go into on this show, um, it's a tumultuous history, and as a result, it looks like there might there may be an ulterior motive. Every time they get an upclick, every time they get a like, a, a retweet, the Shift Crypto Arge brand gains brand equity. And you see, they get exposure, they get awareness, and so from the point of view of a competitor, when they're being asked to give a, a payout for a bounty, I can understand as an outsider how that could maybe be a bit of a sting in the tail. It kind of feels a little bit like you're double dipping, right? Because it also, you know, benefits you in, in other ways. Um, so the, the, then what, what it was revealed is that um, there were these other spun articles, very low quality spun articles. Um, now, a spun article on the internet, if you remember from the old days of SEO, basically you would upload your talking points, you would give it to some reporter, very low quality SEO style reporter, and they would spin it into an article for you. And then they would post it all around uh, the web, they would get it cross posted and, and lots of back links to your website and so on and it will be translated into several language languages so it would appear that a low quality article like this has been shared around the internet with the uh, news title coin uh, the headline coin kites would have hidden that its wallets were vulnerable to remote ha attacks and actually to his credit marco has come out and said look i didn't know about this this looks particularly poor quality um hugo wen um, from nunchuck has also did a, a very good tweet in my opinion um saying look you know a three-month embargo is standard practice and it allows users to patch vulnerabilities before the official disclosure so i think look we don't know who did that but obviously people jump to conclusions because they ask, well, who profits, right? Qui bono, who profits from this? Well, it could be, you know, a salty competitor or somebody that wanted to, I mean, it's essentially a hit piece and a definition of a hit piece is an article that looks unbiased, but actually it's designed to besmirch and uh, tarnish the reputation uh, of somebody, you see. So this is this is problematic, um, and it, it may be that that shift are innocent victims in this. It could be that somebody else did that. Um, it's unlikely that the reporter uh, found it by herself. Um, I think it was Sally Lloyd was her name uh, was one of them. I looked through the the journalist's uh, or the reporter's history. I won't, won't call her a journalist, but the reporter's history. She doesn't have any history of reporting on security issues. She's got one or two on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, uh, but mostly it's just world affairs. So it's it's not really clear on the origins of that. But let's say that exacerbated this story and it kind of aggravated it a lot. So. Continuing then, yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue kind of came up. Um, I, I did point out to Jonas that he should have mentioned that, that, that the bug was patched. But all of this is just leading to questions because back in June, um, Matt O'Dell um, on the Tales of the Crypt, you know, they, they did, uh, him and his, his colleague did do um, a feature saying, look, it looks like Shift Crypto has gone bust. It looks like they've gone out of business. They then had to issue a correction when a back channel was established from Shift to, to try to get them to correct it. But I think, you know, this time um, just more questions have been raised because this hasn't been declared. Also, talking of spin, we haven't really had a, a clear answer from Shift about that uh, bankruptcy because in June, yeah. like I say, several months, yeah, this is this is kind of looking a little, little weird now. Um, let me go to the article. Let me just get it up for you a second, that June article. Yeah, and I mean, re real quick, I just want to say like to, like that just on its face doesn't make sense. Like you go bankrupt when you're having money trouble, 
and then creditors get a claim. So, like, how did they just spin off a new company and just keep going? Like, that yeah. just well, doesn't at face make sense. Yeah, and so and so, I want to drive home again. Um, the 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 shift's own website, Shift Crypto CH, on its about page, claims that they want to maximize transparency. So. In case you're wondering, well, look, you know, they're a private company. Maybe they just had to do some restructuring and it's no big deal. Look, I'm, I'm basically using their own values here. Um, they also say they want authenticity too. Um, let me, in fact, let me go to the about page so that I can actually give you the quote. Uh, so this is a quote from, uh, as it now says, Jonas Shelley, former co-founder and advisor. We aim to minimize the need for trust anything or anyone, including ourselves, and maximize transparency. We value authenticity, minimalism, and thinking outside the box. I mean, look, damn right. right. I mean, I totally agree. So I think in, in the spirit of maximizing transparency, Let's just quickly go over this article that was dated the 2nd of June, 2020. Um, it's titled Shift News, focusing on the core business. Byline, crypto will be focusing their efforts on an open source Bitbox O2 hardware wallet and its companion Bitbox app. We have decided to go to our roots and pull all our efforts into delivering a best in class hardware wallet. This is an interesting way to say we've gone bankrupt. This is a very interesting way to say it. I don't see the word bankrupt anywhere. Essentially, that the way it spins it is, well, look, you know, we had all these other projects. We were a little bit distracted with the Bitbox base, et cetera. Um, but actually, you know, we must just focus now on doing one thing, you know, really well, which is this Bitbox 02. Um, what does this mean for you? Nothing is changing for the Bitbox hardware wallets users. We are uh, committed to delivering and improving, supporting the Bitbox 02 and the Bitbox app. Um, Blah, blah, blah. Just, just regular you know, marketing material. Matt O'Dell, of course, pulled them up on Twitter about that because, you know, people were sending him like, you know, the, the company registry, you know, Switzerland has like many states. They, they have a, a list of public companies and private companies. You can go there anytime. You can look up who is the CEO, who's on the board of directors. And he says, well, look, this is this is crazy. And then Shift put in the dreaded silent edit. Oh, the silent edit is never a good sign. This is terrible for public relations. So a silent edit in media is when you update an article without saying so. Um, it's usually ill-advised. You should usually have some kind of change log or some kind of ETA, as we say in the old days of the internet, edit to add, revision where you just you put in, say again? Revision control. Yeah, revision control, exactly. Um, so they added something at the end to say Shift Crypto RK was founded in Switzerland in 2020. Shift Crypto Security RK closed for internal structural reasons, which I think just means we ran out of money. <laughs> I'm pretty sure internal structure. So this is known as spin. Maybe on the next show, I'll get the Wikipedia entry for, for spin uh, uh, up and we can actually go through one. If I might even do a competition where... Like, if you can give me all the examples of spin in this article and others, I'll send you some some cheeky sat over lightning or something. Um, but yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting way of saying, look, we ran out of money. So there's a new entity now, but the question remains, and what my project for this week is going to be, is like, are the staff getting paid? Like, how are they being remunerated? Um, I've posted up the links on Twitter. It's basically all over my timeline right now. I'm talking to people. I'm engaging people. I'm trying to get information. Um, I think it's a relevant question at a security company. I wouldn't want to get on a plane if the pilot wasn't getting paid, if the crew weren't getting paid. I'd feel a little uneasy about that. Um, maybe that's not the right analogy. I don't know. But, um, yeah. Just lots more questions, really. And yeah, just shocking. Shocking that you would do like a vulnerability disclosure on a, a competitor product, and then, but then not talk about this. It's almost as if it was like a distraction or something. Mm -hmm. Just It's just a marketing strategy. Deflect over there so that people don't look over here. Right. I mean, it could be. If I didn't know any better, I'd say, yeah. I mean, that's my read on it. Like, ev like they have made a habit of, and, and it's even more confusing to me too. Like, explain that bankruptcy because without explaining that on face, you're broke. So how are they paying all of their employees to run around and attack all these different devices? And in CoinKite's case, generally um, constantly spinning, overblowing, making a point about whining, why didn't you pay me for this? Um, like, how is all of that getting paid for? 
Well, they, they could be getting paid in equity. That's one thing. Um, if, it, if it is equity, I would speculate that uh, they, they might have to vest it. I don't want to speculate more than that. Um, but if they're vesting it, then it's like, well, I mean, there are questions here about how secure that really is and what, what their motivations are. Are they motivated to go to work every day? Are they actually, you know, actively going to be looking? Because they, they have also sunsetted and end of life the BitBox One, the controversial hardware device that we mentioned earlier. And I have actually seen comments from Marco, the lead developer on uh, Reddit, say that he strongly recommends that people move coins off there, which is an interesting comment. Uh, there was actually quite a, a stressed out user who posted on Reddit on uh, Beginner's Bitcoin the other day. And he was asking, like, what does it mean on your, because it's just on the FAQ. They have have posted i've seen elvis who's, who's tweeted it as well i don't think they've tried to hide that they've ended life dip but at the moment you know it's not exactly on their front page you know if you bought bitbox one we sold it between this date and this date you know get in touch you know make sure that you check the the, the faq make sure you follow the process if the lead developer is saying he strongly recommends people get their funds off there i think you know maybe more needs to be done to just raise awareness of that fact you know before you point fingers at other hardware wallets maybe just check your own backyard make sure you've got everything in order because this could really bite someone price of bitcoin is going up um, people might remember leaving an old hardware wallet in a drawer somewhere and then they plug it in and i mean it should work in theory i, I look, re, look through the faq it should work with the latest bitbox uh, app hardware i don't think they're going to make it so that it stops working with it um, but for some reason, they say that it might be less convenient in the future to get your coins off. Not clear what that means. Um, but yeah, I think every hour that they spend looking at competitors' wallets is an hour they don't spend on their customers' wallets. It's an hour they're not spending uh, focused on you. And that's what you pay them for. When you buy a hardware wallet, you give them that revenue. You're paying them to look after you. You're not paying them necessarily to go off looking at other hardware wallets, especially if they're not capitalized and they're not getting paid. If you're Ledger and you've got tens of millions in raising then sure you've got the extra you know colorful feathers and you can just ruffle them and show everyone kind of you know the kind of cash you're rolling with but if you're cash strapped that is that is a brutal corporate decision and strategy to take mm -hmm. yeah definitely you know i i want answers to some of these questions because this is just getting ridiculous at this point what do we say in this community again? Is it trust, don't verify, or don't? I can't remember now. Is it, don't, should we, should don't we just trust, trust? Verify. That's oh, it. Oh, that's it? it. That's it. That's it. That's the one. Well, now they don't have Jonas anymore. Maybe people will start to, you know, maybe the credibility is a little bit, oh, okay, a Bitcoin core developer. Okay, we look the other way. We don't ask too many questions, but uh, yeah. we shall see. This community needs to get better at policing itself, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I actually have a unrelated but second example of this kind of thing. Go on. So I noticed this last week, um, the last upgrade for Samurai Wallet on February 5th, um, one of the new features for it was the wallet now keeps a local cache of all the paynim.is info. So like what the actual short paynim, which actual payment code it maps to. And yeah, um, I couldn't help but remember a Twitter thread um, back on February 1st that if I remember correctly, started with Chris Belcher talking about um, pay join support. And Samurai Dev um, and a couple of Samurai users pretty much just started brigading and insulting him. Um, like, what have you done? And I noticed a, a very low followed account started, like somebody who's been following me for quite a while, um, started asking a bunch of honest questions about pay nims, um, and the privacy leakages there specifically related to what happens when you only have the short pay NIM, which is generated from the actual payment code. Um, how does that work? Like, doesn't my wallet have to ping Samurai's pay NIM server and give it the short name and get the actual payment code so that Samurai knows my identity if I'm a light wallet user just wanted that payment code? And 
th there's not really much here um, because all, all they could really do with that is associate that to an XPUB for a light wallet user and maybe know which um, pay them a opening transaction on chain for that um, map to. But it, it is still nonetheless a little privacy leak. And TDEV's only response to this was a just pissy tweet. The spec, Paynim short names are not defined in bit 47. Oh, I made this thing. But then four days later, um, the wallet quietly patches that slight privacy leak by caching all of that data locally um, after this thread where he completely did not engage with this user or, ANSI or answer any question related to this whatsoever. Um, he, it just dodge on Twitter, quietly patch it. And I just thought that was kind of interesting. Like, the, you know, the, this is a, a privacy tool that had not severe by any means whatsoever a privacy leak that they were being explicitly questioned about and they just danced around didn't answer and then just quietly patched it and hoped it would go away yeah it's like the silent edit the silent patch you just brush it under the table you don't tell people how urgent it is mm -hmm. i mean yeah this is what happens when you foster an environment where instead of working together you're just constantly shit talking people including your own users or even other wallet users who might i don't know might possibly use your wallet and your first response is to shit on them <laughs> instead of uh i don't know looking at it and then and then because of that mentality then you're it's like i don't know you're too embarrassed to then point out that they might have been right because you i don't know it's just again it's part of this whole thing that i find very annoying is that i am very careful in terms of my reporting and talking to people about privacy tools in Bitcoin, I try to steer them away from this social media shit because it's not productive and at the end of the day it's kind of it's like, I don't know if it's better or close to or worse than the hardware wallet bickering, but it's pretty similar in that it just, it gets used by uh, charlatans like JW to scare people out of even using hardware wallets at all. And they don't know what the truth is. All they see is pe people arguing. They don't have they don't have the the resources or knowledge to understand these debates, and so they're just going to cut it off. Yep. And like th this is not the first time either that Samurai has just quietly patched an issue that people were not aware of and just never acknowledged it publicly. Like, I, I'm aware of at least one other incident of that. It, it wasn't a privacy issue, but it was a serious issue. And they just patched it, pretended it never happened, and moved on. And it's also important that paynims get looked at more, because at the moment, Samurai is the only one that implements it. And that's sad, like, more wallets should do it, but if the if the general if there's this like general tension and infighting it's going to be really hard to get i mean for one it's a privacy feature and there aren't that many privacy wallets so it's going to be really hard to get other privacy wallets or other wallets to work with them to you know implement something that's compatible which it should be uh, like I, it's it's not viable long term to just have one wallet because basically that means if you're using Paynims at all, it's very obvious which wallet you're using. Um, so, like, it's just, it's, I don't know. This should not be the way that people respond to each other. Yeah. Like, people aren't improving like that spec they aren't expanding on it they aren't finding any issues that might exist they're not extending it in any way um entirely because of this stupid attitude yeah and i have to just remind people once again because i keep hearing jw's name and apparently i don't know i guess he's caught the attention of more people yeah so he he was basically a no-name person back in, what was it, November 2017, which is around the time that he actually bought Bitcoin for the first time. And 
he was on the show a lot for like six months ish and a little over six months and yeah he ended up not being who he said he was and since then he's managed to grow a following outside of us and we've continued to warn people about how he's an idiot and gives really terrible advice and shows he has no no fundamental understanding of bitcoin whatsoever and people still i've noticed especially like sorry to do the religion card but people who are religiously inclined in the space like no no problem with you being religious but you're kind of banding together with other religious bitcoiners who are not smart or honest people just on the basis that they share your religious affiliation and i would just like to say um Jesus would probably have something to say about that. <laughs> you know, just saying. Yep. And it's like, like the reason he's not here anymore is because he would do no research and constantly say incorrect things and then ignore anybody else bringing up that was wrong. You should learn what you're talking about first. And he's just a liar. I remember when he had a wife and that was his constant excuse to dip off after recordings to, oh, wait, I'm a single divorced father. Um, that's been the shtick for forever. Um, he's been a academic um, math professor, security reacher, or researcher, all, all these things that he, when you really start talking to him about stuff, he, he barely has the Vegas grasp of. He, he's a complete bio fraud. research lab. He secured a bio research lab at the age of 21. Yeah. But, you know, it's just, yeah. I think that should tell you something when stuff like this happens. When a developer, a project lead refuses to engage with open, honest questions about their product that might indicate a flaw in it and just quietly patch without acknowledging yes that flaw exists and just try to sweep it under the rug like you should ask yourself what kind of person acts like that and does not publicly hold themselves accountable for things they do publicly well i mean just to make clear i'm not equate i i mean maybe maybe you want to but i'm not equating samurai wallet with shift because um from my perspective oh, by samurai no at least samurai at least did something useful <laughs> and created a functional product that you know isn't whatever yeah that proportionally they are nowhere near the same thing it's just it's in my mind the commonality is the behavior like i mean it's kind of fucked up when you have an issue that exists in something that nobody will acknowledge publicly because brand look bad that's that is a very bad environment to create in this space. Well, you just summed up. I mean, that is a problem throughout this space. It's a problem with throughout exchanges. I mean, a, a lot of this, okay, let's summarize it this way. The barriers to entry have gone way down on the costs of setting up a business, especially in crypto. It was true before Bitcoin in the startup scene in Silicon Valley, but it's definitely true now. It's cheaper to produce a hardware wallet than ever before. It's cheaper to set up an exchange than ever before. It's cheaper to set up an ICO as a quasi business and raise millions of dollars without putting in any real effort into business plans and all this kind of stuff. So it feels cheap, right? The cost of starting a business feels cheap, but the reality doesn't kick in until later in the business. And the problem is that because the barrier to entry is lower is it brings in all kinds of just untalented, uh, Dunning-Kruger. I mean, it's just, this whole space is just full of Dunning-Kruger. People who are smart enough to think that they're smart and they don't realize what they don't know. So they go in really bullish and they think, oh, yeah, I can do all these things. And it's like, yeah, and that, you know, with a hardware wallet, for example, maybe they order a bunch of equipment off of Alibaba and they feel like geniuses because they're just purchasing all this stuff from China and they're putting it together and they can hack a demo together. Yep. But hacking a demo together, I mean, you got to put your big boy pants on, right? Like you're going to go out there and you're going to start competing with these like multi-million dollar, you know, decades of experience security companies who've got layers and layers of 
you know, auditing, you know, continuous auditing. They've got all, all the things. And you're just a whippersnapper with a vision and a concept. I mean, this space is not short of concepts. It's got some really good conceptual designers. I would actually say Douglas at Shift is a very good conceptual designer. But it, when, when it comes to execution, yeah, that's that's when you, you sift the men, the men from the boys. And then it's just like all this emotional instability, you know, shooting each other. And then you've got social media, right? It's a perfect place for everyone to just call each other names in 140 characters or 280, you know? Yep. And it leads to just uncertainty. Like, how is that productive? Yeah, it's not. All righty, Janine. So I, I I heard that your favorite object from the Lord of the Rings um, climbed the Swiss Alps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, seems seems like they've done that. Um, is, so there was an article in German from Schweizer Radio and Fernsehen, um, SRF, um, about how the European branch of Palantir will be settled in the middle canton in Switzerland, Schweiz. Um, of course, there are many people who are not happy about that, including the Swiss branch of the Chaos Computer Club. And the article has an interview with CCC's uh, Hernani Marquez, who says that one of the main reasons Palantir is interested in settling in Switzerland is actually the lack of good data protection laws, which is probably an interesting perspective to people outside of Switzerland who often perceive Switzerland as some kind of ultimate safe haven gold standard in terms of privacy. That's actually not entirely the case uh, when compared, to, like, especially when you're dealing with, you know, your the privacy of your data, especially if you're not in Switzerland with a Swiss company and what, uh, what, uh, uh, let's say uh, mechanisms of recourse you have. Um, so yeah, uh, and he, you know, com in comparison to like the GDPR in in general Europe, which, as far as I know, does not apply to Switzerland. Um, he also cites the crypto AG scandal. I'm just going to say AG so that we can stop making gay jokes, but uh, <laughs> AG, uh, which we covered in episode 247. In short, it's about how a uh, company in Switzerland was basically owned by the CIA for a very long time. Surprise, surprise. And, and in fact was, you know, owning the Swiss government and was owning other government computers around the world. So good for them. Um, he states that Palantir's client list reads as a who's who of the entire military industrial complex. And of course the CIA was a early client and funder of Palantir. Like there is no, there, there's no way you can really look at Palantir and get get them in a good light uh, if you care at all about the fact that the military industrial complex is evil. So, um, but yeah, so the, the Palantir joke, obviously, um, I don't know actually if I talked about that on the show, but in short, um, the kind of CEO of Palantir uh, was interviewed in a very long article, and he kind of made this claim that actually the Palantir, which is from Lord of the Rings, it's that uh, glowing orb thing that Sauron's eye appears in, and Aragorn kind of like fights visually with in the last movie and book of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, yeah, so he tried, the CEO of Palantir tried to claim that the Palantir was actually a good device because it helped trick Sauron into not seeing Frodo go into Mordor, which is, um, yeah, that's weird literary analysis that is so full of shit that it kind of just shows me that they struggle with the or their own lack of ethics, that they have to come up with that kind of story to make sense of why their name is Palantir. Um, related to that, um, I don't think I mentioned this either, but they have recently made some kind of government decision-making operating system or software or something, and guess what they called it? You saw this, Shinobi, right? Drop it. Yeah, so the name that they gave it was Gotham, because of course, if you want <laughs> if you want to help governments make decisions, you want to name it after the worst and most corrupt city, kind of in comic book history. 
Like, that just sounds like a great ideal to strive for. Um, so, like, if you need further evidence that their naming schemes are, like, f flashing bright lights in your face, we are evil, um, I don't know what further evidence you need. But, uh, yeah, in this article, I mean, he didn't go into that about Plantier. That was just my own interest in Plantier and how weirdly transparently evil they are. Um, he also, in, in this interview, points out that there are Swiss banks who are customers of Plantier and that they have interest in financial analysis slash surveillance since the very beginning because, um, as everyone knows, Plantier was conceived by Peter Thiel initially as an anti-fraud algorithm for PayPal, uh, which he also co-founded. So yeah, um, yeah, Switzerland, not so great. Um, and Palantir is now in Switzerland and people are not happy about it. Um, and who knows what shenanigans they will get up to there. Building the eye of Sauron. Yeah. I mean, I guess, uh, I guess they're going to make a lot of the snow melt. I don't know why I even tried to make that sound. I knew I was going to fail. So, you ready for something weirder than Palantir in Switzerland? Lil Wayne, Jay-Z, and Jack Dorsey are collectively pledging 500 Bitcoin to create an entity to fund Bitcoin development. That's right. You heard that right. Lil Wayne and Jay-Z are going to fund Bitcoin development. Huh. What's 500 Bitcoin in uh, shit fiat terms? My brain does not want to do math. I mean, couldn't you just, I mean, we can just assume that Bitcoin's at 50,000 at this point, right? And just multiply the zeros. Nine. You will do this accurately. Wait, are you, are you using a calculator right now, Shinobi? I think the chat yes. box beat you. I quite literally, I don't care. It's 24.5 mil punks. No, that that's incorrect. Bitcoin is already at 50k according to my Twitter timeline. We're 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 already predicting incorrect. 100k. Which means it must be at 50k by now if we're already talking about larger numbers. Nope. Oh, man. Anyway, anyway, yeah. Um rappers funding Bitcoin development fun. And then I guess the let's just buzz out the last two. So <clears throat> Apple is partnering with BitPay to allow you to use BitPay prepaid MasterCards with Apple Pay. Um, the funny, I, I lost track of the number of people who I saw tweeting that um, they had already had their crypto cards on Apple Pay for forever. So I don't really know what Apple's doing here. Um, but then also um, MasterCard plans to start clearing crypto on their network this year so do the the fiat exchange um through partners of theirs um for for merchant settlement and if one of those partners name is not bitpay then bitpay is kind of fucked because you just had mastercard come in and pretty much go we're gonna be bitpay now Yep. You could say that they uh made them obsolete. <laughs> but the thing is BTC Pay server already did, so is this like double obsolescence? This is actually stomping it into the ground cuz if BitPay isn't one of those partners, then they're fucked. Like a major legacy payment processor just decided they're coming for your market. You're fucked. <laughs> Yeah, that must explain why uh, they have shif shifted to the uh, surveillance model and now are trying to collect YC information from people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm going to get a lot of schadenfreude out of watching some of the shitty companies in this space just get obliterated by legacy companies adopting Bitcoin and doing their thing. It's going to suck, but it's going to be so great. I have to say, though, like, I mean, I've never used 
I've never used Apple Pay or any of these things, but like my experience with just bank transfers in general is just so terrible. I realized the other day that I've never successfully sent a bank transfer in my life. Like something always goes wrong and I have to I have to resort to something else. I Fun thought times. about years ago using the Samsung Pay thing when I had a Samsung because it actually had the magnet in there um, for the strip and you could literally just use it on legacy scanners dragging it across. But then I went, no, why do I want to permanently store a card number in my phone? That's stupid. But yeah, who's got some, some fun final thoughts, some jokes, some memes? Come on, it's, it's time for the final memes, guys. 50K. I mean, I saw. To I heard I Matt mean, Odell I s- has fun being wrong. I missed that last part. Is is it something about how he's still shouting in caps? No, it was that that uh, rabbit hole recap where he just stayed on for like another two hours or something with random people because he wanted to be right about the show not ending till fifty k. Oh, I thought that was. Isn't that Citadel Dispatch? It was the last rabbit hole recap. Marty left, and then oh. Matt just stayed there and like brought Rodolfo and um I forget his name, the uh, <laughs> Zeus stab, and just people just started piling in, and it was like that for like two hours. I mean, that's kind of funny because I think they started off the episode by Marty saying, "Yeah, didn't you go for like a record-breaking four hours with Rodolfo, and you guys just got drunk and shouted at each other?" And then they do it on, yeah, and then it repeats. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the only meme I can share is that before I came on the show, I saw a tweet from Elon Musk, the all hail Daddy Musk, apparently, um, with a a meme, or I I don't know if I called a meme, it's just a horrible art mistake, but some kind of stained glass window where they try it, they, (laughs) it's a, it's a picture of, I think, Mary, um, holding dead Jesus in her arms, and they attempted to make a shadow like the underside of his leg is supposed to be kind of shadowed on this stained glass window but it (laughs) it just looked like she's holding his dick okay you can cut that out of the show (laughs) nope i just thought i should share (laughs) i don't think i will i've been making dick jokes every show now I'm pretty sure my favorite one is still about the the incitement to erection. <laughs> well, on that note, if uh, nobody's got anything else, uh, I'm going to go on my merry way and find the half of America losing their mind to laugh at. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Catch you later, punks. Later. My apologies. Ele <laughs> <laughs>